Welcome everyone. This is Terry Peer from Real Wildlife Products. Welcome to episode two of It's Time to Get Real. Uh, we're actually sitting inside of Don's new trophy room. Uh, we recorded here the Chasing Giants podcast last night. We thought it'd be a good opportunity with all of us in the same place to sit in front of a camera versus try to uh, get high tech red next to do online meetings for you guys. So bear with us. We're going to try to do this in one take and um, try to give you guys some um, good um, information um, with episode two. And we're going to start out with talking about Miscanthus. Uh, we released this for pre-order sales online. Um, Miscanthus orders are open. Uh, we try to har uh, plan the harvest of these rhizomes based on a pre-order. So, uh, Don, I'm going to start with you. Talk us through what the what a rhizome is, how it's different from seed, how it's kind of mm -hmm. like a tree seedling. Uh, kind of tell everybody what what the deal is with these rhizomes. Well, so a rhizome is a, it's a piece of root. It's going to be about four to six inches long, and um, you, you know the miscanthus is a sterile uh, hybrid. This giant miscanthus that we're selling, so it does not produce seed. It's non-invasive, so it doesn't spread. The only way you can uh, spread it is basically taking a piece of this root and planting it. So it, it's like it, it's live plant material, just like a live tree seedling. So, you know, it, it needs proper storage. It needs to, to have moisture, and it needs to be kept cool so it stays dormant. If it's warm, it'll start sprouting. So it's, um, you know, a little more fragile than seed. So, you know, it takes a, a little more caution on our side right. so we want to be able to harvest that from the field and get it to the end user as efficiently as possible uh the earlier we plant it the better right um you know one of the misconceptions of of people planting miscanthus is we we do it at the same time we do seed and really as soon as we can get in the field um, we want to start with a clean seed bed, obviously, but as soon as we right. can get in the field, get it in the ground because that's that's actually acting as the cooler, mm -hmm. if you will, um, than we would be storing it in a refrigerator. Now, Wes, we, we talk a little bit about planting in three and five uh, row screens. This product is not made for bedding. Correct. Um, I think some people misunderstand when they see how thick this stuff is. It, it, it's not cost effective to put a field of this stuff out for bedding. You need to look at probably switchgrass or bedding in a bag for that. This is a screening product. Um, can you give the, the people a little bit of tips as far as how far does a 100 rhizome bag go? When do we need to look at bulk bags versus 100 rhizome bags? How do you you know kind of plan it on a grid? How far is my rows apart? <coughs> Yeah, like you mentioned, Terry, um, this really is for screening. So you want to think of um, miscanthus plantings being a linear um, plot. It's not going to be square acreage like switchgrass or bedding in a bag would be. But giant miscanthus, um, we sell it in 100 count bags. Those are typically about this big, then 5,000 and 10,000 rhizome bulk bags. Okay. So a 100 rhizome count bag um, we'll go 50 yards if it's one row. And we need at least three or five rows to... To really make a good five screen. is Five is better and will be thicker earlier to where it's a screen, um, right. but it needs to be at least three better to five. Right. If you're thinking it of it as three rows, then that one bag will get you 17 yards. Okay. So... Um, Personally, on our properties, we like to go five. Uh, right, right. Uh, we're impatient. We want to get as quick as we can, as thick as we can. Five rows is best. Gotcha. And then we, we get into bulk bags. Um, if you if you just use um, simple math, um, you know, three rows going, um, you said 17 yards, I think is what you said, right? Yep. yep. Three rows, that's just keep multiplying that. If you get up around the, what did we say earlier, 2,700 um, it's 3,700. Yeah. 3,700. Yeah. Excuse yeah. me. You might as well just get a bulk bag cause you're paying for the same right. price as on a bulk bag, but you're able to go another 130 yards right. basically for the same amount of money. If you're going to buy, I mean, upwards of 20, 25 bags, you should start thinking about, Hey, I'm maybe I should just look at a bulk bag. Plus the shipping too. Exactly. Yeah. So um, maybe you can you know plant some stuff at your friend's house or around your deck or your pool. Uh, Don and I were driving to church this morning and I actually saw giant miscanthus out in a field uh, that was coming up around a soybean field that somebody had put in. 
Um, Don, you, you've planted miscanthus for many years here on this farm. You have some stands that's five, six plus years old. Um, since you've been so successful, can you give uh, um, the listeners some basic prep on what do I do with my soil? How do I do weeds? What's what's the best way to get it ready to have the best success rate? This stuff isn't cheap. Mm-hmm. You know, the cost of it, we're amateurizing over 30 years because it's going to come back every year. We don't want it to fail right out of the gate. So what, what's some prep tips? Well, I tell everybody to think of miscanthus as they would corn. Um, you need a site that's um, full sun. You need it away from the woods. Um, you, you need freedom of... Uh, competition down in the root zone you don't want it close to trees where the tree roots are going to compete with it and and you need to start with bare soil that's been well worked just the same as you would with corn Uh, what i like to do is with my atv sprayer you know spray the strip where i'm going to plant it first kill all the vegetation and then i come back with a tiller on my tractor and i till up that ground and then plant the rhizomes that loose dirt allows that that piece of root to root out and branch out and grow new roots a lot easier Yeah, a lot of guys spend the money to get a product like this and then don't take care of the weeds before they put it in. Much, you know, Dwayne can talk to that about, you know, food plot seed too. We spend all this money up front and you don't do the little steps that make or break your success um, with a good stand a couple years later. Right. Now, when, when we till that, um, when we till that strip up, so we've ran a rotavator through it, or maybe even somebody with a short strip, maybe even a hand, you know, find a way to do it. Maybe it's a disc, but we've eliminated the weeds. We've worked the ground. What are some different ways to actually put that rhizome in the ground? Well, I mean, the best way really, especially if you got a sizable planting, is with a tree seedling planter that's pulled behind a tractor, you know, that somebody sits on, it opens a trench, and then there's packer wheels that close it, close that trench, um, you want to get those rhizomes about three to four inches deep, um, space them anywhere from 12 to 18 inches apart, um, and just make sure that soil is loose. But weed control is also very important. So uh, you can spray right over the top of it with a residual herbicide such as atrazine, simazine, um, just about anything you could use on corn, you could use on miscanthus. And uh, We have a really good blog on the Real World website. Click on the blog tab, and it goes through all of the different chemicals that you can use on uh, miscanthus grass. You mentioned that uh, um, the the tree seedling machine. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of people might not know what that is, but uh, you probably can either access one for free or for a very small price from your ag extension office. Um, you know, the people that do CRPs and all that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. go talk to them. If they don't have one, I'm sure they can probably find, put you in touch with somebody who has them. But if you're having long strips, I know Wes, you've used a spade and a shovel to plant rows of it before and it can be done, but it takes a little work, doesn't it? Don keeps telling me to work smarter and not harder, but <laughs> not very good at it yet. He's still learning. All right. Well, the, the last thing I wanted to touch on with miscanthus is, you know, the long-term benefits of it. You know, we're not we're not planning a year. We've we've tested a ton of different year screening annual products before, and they just don't work very good. And you got to plant them every year. You spend a little bit more time, a little bit more labor up front with this product, but it lasts forever. Uh, Wes, if if I planted miscanthus last year and I was just amazed with how it did, I'm coming up on the first winter. What are the things that I need to watch for? to make sure it's successful because I don't want to just slack off. I want to watch the weather. I want to watch the weeds. What do I need to look for? <clears throat> right, Terry. That's the, f- the one thing that you really need to be careful about with first year miscanthus is that first winter. If you have frigid temperatures below 10 degrees at around zero degrees, if they're, if you had negative temperatures, particularly without snow cover, that's dangerous times for for long periods for, of time for I mean, first year miscanthus. Yeah, yes. so if it just drops in for a day or two, you're probably going to be okay. But I know last year, uh, Minnesota's um, Minnesota, uh, um, Wisconsin, the Dakotas, they got the really frigid temperatures like normal, but no snowfall whatsoever. So they didn't have that insulation over the top of it. Right. That's where you really need to watch is if we have no snow cover and long. Um, periods of time where it's sub-zero temperatures, that could actually create a problem for miscanthus to survive. Right, and if you can see those uh, conditions coming in the forecast, you might think about uh, getting some bales of straw or sawdust or helping 
artificially some type insulate. of insulator. So yep. get a round bell, cut the bands off of it, and unroll it down the strip, whatever we need to do. But mm-hmm. but that's something to really watch for for that first year miscanthus. We've spent all this money. We've seen the benefit of it coming up. We want it to survive. Don is that is that root and or excuse me that rhizome continues to mature and gets hardier. It's not a problem on further down, especially because we have all that thatch coming up the top, mm-hmm. and that acts as an insulator. Yeah, the the better it gets established, you know, the better it can handle the cold conditions in the winter. And like you mentioned, Terry, then you've got that insulation from the plant itself um, falling on the ground, you know, from multiple years and. It insulates it, and, and it'll survive at that point. Yeah. So I hope that helps. Those, those are some of the most common questions we get about miscanthus is how much do I need and, and uh, how do I plant it? Um, again, it's the best thing you can do is order your miscanthus early because we are planning that harvest as soon as we can get in the ground. We want those rhizomes to be as fresh as they can when they get to your door. Um, Wes, any, any quick tips on when we, when they do get the rhizomes there, um, if you're not going to plant them, you know, the day that it, it arrives, probably mm-hmm. refrigeration is the best thing. If you can keep them cold temperatures like a deer cooler or something, that's fantastic. Yep. Um, wouldn't want it to go very long. So when you go on our website and you go to order your miscanthus or you're talking with your local dealer, figure out when that ship date is and make sure that we're, our ground has worked um, you know, obviously Mother Nature plays the, the most pivotal role in that, but ultimately we want our ground to be worked to where when that comes in, think of it like a tree. You know, we may order trees all the time. You know, you, you don't leave that setting in your garage for mm-hmm. a month before you go out and put it in. It is a living root that we need to get into the ground. Um, I want to shift a, a gears for a minute and talk and switch to our 2021 pilot program uh, for all the people that follow Real World, they know that we released the NutraCrave corn and the Enlist soybeans as a pilot program. Those were both products that we had tested for years, put blends together, and then we released that to the, the market in a limited trial. Um, we're going to first start with the NutraCrave program. Uh, Don, can you give a brief history about kind of, you were the first one that started with this high oil corn Um Kind of what's what's the origination of your thoughts on it? Why we're doing it? Um, kind of what the tissue analysis when we get that mm-hmm. high oil? What does that mean for the wildlife? Well, actually, the the search for a, a corn for wildlife food plots has been in the works with Real World for many years, and uh, our our soybean program was so successful that we wanted a, a corn product to complement that. And we looked and looked and looked, and finally we hit on this uh, particular variety of corn that's a high oil corn. And uh, not only was it high oil, it was high protein. And in, in the test plots on my farm from two years ago, um, this NutriCrave corn tested out at 11.2% protein, where a nearby ag field corn was 6.8. So significantly more protein, but the big deal was the the oil level was almost four times higher and uh, it's a non-gmo so it's not roundup ready and we know that that deer and wildlife like a non-gmo plant better than a gmo so when you combine the fact that it's higher in protein it's higher in fat and it's a non-gmo the deer just destroy it and it's better for them It, it was It also tested higher in calcium, phosphorus, and all the other, you know, micronutrients. Um, So, and and the the deer actually will even eat the stalk. Not only the grain, but in the green stage, they'll even eat the stalk right down to nothing. We had about a 30-degree temperature drop today in Illinois, Mm -hmm. and I hunted over a NutriCrave corn site and... You know, just the, the deer came in. I, I honestly don't know if they were eating the ear or they were eating the stalk, maybe both, but, you know, it's mm-hmm. dried down, and, and every single deer that came out came and fed to that and eventually transitioned onto the beans. Um, so I can tell you, even just tonight with the cold temperatures, um, how much the deer are attracted to it. Wes, uh, Don just kind of alluded to it just a little bit there. I want you to expand on one of the biggest questions we get is, are we going to do a Roundup Ready version? If not, why? Uh, I'm going to defer that one back to Don. Don, do you want to expand on it? <laughs> yeah, put me on the spot. <laughs> um, you know, originally when we came out with this, we had talked with our, our partners at Kitchen Seed about um, 
bringing the Roundup Ready trait into this corn, and that was the plan. But the feedback we've got from our customers, it's about – we've got people that want it both ways. we got some that wish they could spray Roundup on it to kill the weeds. But we probably had twice as many people say, leave it as it is. Leave it non-GMO. The, the deer like the non-GMO crops better. Um, there's a, um, a wide range of different chemicals that can be used on it um, to control the weeds. So you need to be on top of your chemical program, and, and you can go to your local chemical dealer. I'm not one. To, we're not going to sit here and, and offer advice on the chemicals to use. Go to your local you know, herbicide chemical dealer and ask them for advice, and you can control the weeds in non-GMO corn. Yeah, I think it's just the people, um, especially inexperienced food plotters, are used to just torching everything with Roundup. Yep. Um, corn's not, we'll be the first ones to say it, corn is not the average food plotter that's just getting into food plotting. Um, we'll talk about it in just a minute, but it's it, it, it requires equipment, it's going to require a different chemical program, and the, the last thing we want to do is recommend a chemical that, some state might not even be able to get because of a permit. Your best bet is to talk to your extension office or a local row crop farmer. Uh, before we move on to Dwayne, though, real quick, we've we've actually been approached by um, you know dairy farmers mm-hmm. to to also use this on dairy farms because they want that high oil because then they don't have to buy the protein and and fat in commodities for whatever they're mixing with their silage. Yep. So that's another reason that we're staying with that. So, um, Dwayne, do you got any comment on that real quick? I just uh, touch on the fact that I think that we will still offer a Roundup Ready food plot corn if somebody feels like that's what they've got to have. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's just I, not the Nutri Crave. So that's we correct. we don't we that's a that's a great point. I didn't even put that on our outline. Um, if if you do contact us, we can get you a uh, a Roundup Ready corn. Um, but it's it's not the NutriCrave um, high oil package. Um, while we're with you, Dwayne, um, you know your experience with kitchen seed in the ag industry. I think you're the best one that can talk a little bit about to food plotters and educate them on. Uh, we sell a one acre bag. In in corn, that means something different than beans. So talk about the population rate, talk about the different size, because people are going to have to know what plates to use, how we label the bags. Can you walk us through that just a little bit? Right. So the, the Nutri-Crave corn will come in in one acre bag, and it'll have 26,600 seeds per bag. Mm-hmm. Now, because of kernel size and kernel weight, that could be a 14-pound bag. It could be a 18-pound bag. doesn't mean that anybody's getting shorted or getting any extra. It's all about kernel kernel count. Kernel size, basically. Kernel density and kernel weight. So <clears throat> corn, actually, um, you line up the plate in your planter based on the size corn, and usually there's about three or four different size corn kernels. Is, am I right by that? That's correct. So usually it's a, it'll either be a round or a flat, and then the size will be small, medium, or large. And the corn industry has gotten – universal i guess for lack of a better term and they call it plateless okay so if if you've got a plate planter that requires a certain plate you need to take the corn out of the bag and you need to set your plates on the on the table and you need to size the plate for the size kernel that you've got yeah so like i'm using an old two row alice chalmer i'm going to lay my plates out and basically make sure that each of those kernels i'm only getting one kernel inside the grooves of that plate and they're not too big that they're not dropping down in basically that's right that's that's what you're looking for right a little effort will keep you from doing doubles or, or skips in that yeah. so. the, the one of the biggest questions we get Wes, is can i broadcast corn you and Don, either one, want to <laughs> – the, the average food plotter just doesn't know. You know, they, mm-hmm. they they think, oh, well, great, I'll go do that. I'm just going to broadcast it and cult to pack it in. Well, you, you can, but you're going to get a very poor crop. I mean, corn is really a, a crop that should be left to the more experienced food plotter. You, you need good equipment. Uh, that, that corn, each plant needs good spacing. You, know, you can't have two or three real close together. Um, it, it needs a lot of – fertilizer nitrogen specifically um and it costs a good little bit to plant an acre of corn is you're probably going to spend at least 500 bucks per acre to get a good crop yeah when all the inputs are right put in place to it so i might add with that with the broadcasting aspect of it corn wants to be planted at an an inch and a half deep Mm -hmm. and if you're not if you get any shallow on that you're not going to get the brace roots you're not going to survive drought conditions 
And a lot of the places we're putting this stuff isn't isn't rich black black Illinois farm dirt. Right. So it's it broadcasting just just is a tra- it's a train it's future train wrecks. What it so is. I might mm-hmm. I might really mess this uh, episode up by saying this. I believe off the top of my head the Nutri Crave is a hundred and nine day corn. Is that right? Uh, Somewhere right, right in there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So when the other question somebody asks us is when do I plant it? Um, you've said from the minute the first time I ever was in a meeting with you, don't plant by the calendar, plant by the weather. You know, we're, right. we're looking for the right conditions. And I think the best advice that we can give people is go talk to a local row crop farmer that's next to you and find out what he's doing, mirror what he's doing. You know, you can go to that row crop farmer and say, "Are you what? Wh- how many day corn are you planting?" I got 109. Watch what they're doing and follow that map. Um, again, the average food plotter. This is a, a on the on the higher end of the experience level, but um, the demand is obviously there for the people who want it. So um, this product is going to go directly into a standard product. We we um, had a, a really nice bag designed for it. It is no longer in a pilot program. The same blend that we sold yesterday is now a standard product for us. All right. All right, Terry, the bag came in Wednesday last week and they'll be in full production this week. If you all only knew the supply chain issues, how it even affects bags, you would, you would totally laugh at the, the world we live in right now. So do we have anything else on the Nutri-Crave corn uh, for you guys? I don't think so. I, I think, the magic number is 60, Terry. You want 60 degrees or better to plant corn. When you plant it at 60 degrees, degrees it will go. We plant it at 55, it's going to get you there and be lazy. And the longer it lays there, the more subject it is to adversity and, and secondary issues. So okay. 60 is the number. 60 is the magic number. Plant by the weather, not the calendar, right? All right. Okay. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the 2021 uh, Enlist 3 uh, soybean program. Um, just like the Nutri-Crave corn, we came out with a standard variety and a northern variety because uh, we just had so many areas in the country that were struggling with uh, glyphosate tolerant weeds. Talk a little bit about this product and why it's important for the areas that get hit with some of these weeds, why they have another chemical program that they can use. Don? Well, quite simply, Terry, the the overuse and misuse of Roundup or glyphosate has caused a lot of weeds to become resistant. So if one of those resistant weeds is an issue on your farm or in your soybean plot and you go to spray it, to, you planted a Roundup ready soybean and you go to spray it, well, guess what? You're not touching those weeds. It, uh, they become resistant just like the soybeans are resistant. So we needed a, another chemical program and this is not just something that's unique to the food plot industry. I mean, the whole ag industry is struggling with the same thing, and Dwayne can probably touch on this a lot better than I can. But having the Enlist soybean is a complement to our Gen 2 soybeans because if you're using the Gen 2 year after year, you're using the same chemical program year after year. And if you break up that cycle with the Enlist beans, you can take care of a lot of those weeds and uh, maybe do that for a year or two and come back with the gen twos right so you know we're going to still we're still going to offer both platforms um expand a little bit on that Dwayne, because um you know looking looking at our gen two platform if we're really honest our soybean blend is what built this company um that is our flagship program you know, high oil, shatter resistance. We want big, tall plants, but we want them to be able to mature and not hold moisture into the winter so we don't have mold or or shattering. Um, but we want that blend so that field doesn't change over immediately like an ag bean would. And, you know, a farmer wants that whole field to flip and be dry so he can get in and combine it before it shatters. We want that field to slowly change from green to dry through the fall while we're hunting over it. Was the same theory in finding beans in the blend the same for Enlist, just with a different chemical trait? Sure, Terry. So our platform really didn't change is what we, in our maturity ranges, maybe slightly, but but the idea is to have an early an early bean, a couple mediums, and a really full season bean in the blend. So we got that late season stay green, late season browse on the green, uh, and the maturities that we use probably aren't always friendly for the farmers in your area, 
but we're not worried about harvestability. We're worried about durability and and the soil types that we know that these beans are going to go sure. on. So both both platforms carry a very basic uh, similarities. Well, I want you to talk about the group numbers in just a second, but I don't think that we do a good enough job as a company to also state what the other benefit of having a blend of soybeans is. Because, you know, we're setting in a period right now where we've had super wet conditions across the Midwest, no freezing temperatures basically until today. So shatter is not really a problem for the most part right now. But in different areas of the country, depending on maybe the soil, depending on the weather, depending on the wind, having a blend helps you basically overcome a problem that if you just planted one group number or one type blend and it maybe had a shatter problem, you know, because of a, a variable that year, you have three other robust ones that, that aren't going to fall in that same line. Mm -hmm. We don't do a good enough job talking about that. That's the other benefit. You can elaborate a little bit about having a blend of beans. It's All not right. just the maturity. Well, by having a blend, what we're doing is our hedging our bets. So, you know, certain climatic conditions come along and one of those beans in the mix may shatter but we've got three more that didn't right where if if you was a food plotter and you just went out and you know and, and this is I, I did this years ago before the days of real world i just get soybean seed from my neighbor whatever it was and some years it worked fine but a lot of years that variety would shatter before the winter was over and all those beans were laying in the mud or the snow but you know, having that, that blend of four beans, you're, we're hedging our bets that three of them four is not going to shatter. Because variables from year to year with the weather conditions right. is going to change every time. If we knew exactly what it was going to do weather-wise, we could yeah. dial in a whole lot more. Right. Um, Dwayne, we talked a little bit about with corn being 109-day corn. Beans are not labeled the same way as far as maturity. Can you just give a quick 30,000 foot view of how beans are measured with group numbers. It's not really days. It's it's a group number sliding scale from low to big. Sure. So corn is, is measured in maturity by heat units. Uh, soybeans are measured more by sunlight hours. Certain amount of sunlight, they'll start, or in the fall, they'll start to yellow up and so their maturity is based on on day hours of sunlight each day. So as my days start to get shorter, the beans start maturing. That's correct. Okay. Right? So that's why with the, the the four beans that we've put in each of these blends, we see the yellowing start, but we still see some others that maintain green leaves much much longer into the fall. So the lower the group number bean the shorter the season is that's right and the higher the bean so uh from a scale like a two a group number two would be a very short season bean a group number five would be a long season bean that's correct so on, on our northern blends we're somewhere around group ones all the way out to maybe all the way up to group late twos threes and then on our that, that'd be in our northern uh varieties that we offer across the midwest we're somewhere between group four all the way up to 5.4 right and and the thing that it is a little misleading the the growing season is it doesn't run straight east to west across the country it comes across iowa and ohio and it actually takes a big hook to the north up into up into new york we maybe we can share that picture one day but it's yep it's um the beans are very versatile for, for the areas that we ship them to. So the, the line that he's talking about, we have a really good graphic I'm going to show on the screen right now. Um, if you're on the north side of it, we're saying use the northern blend. If you're on the south side of it, use the regular blend. But that's basically aligning the group number in that bl blend for what your growing season is going to that's be. That's correct. And, and maybe, it, maybe it's even beneficial. We didn't talk about this ahead of time, but we're about the honest truth here and understanding things. You know, one of the fads in the industry right now is forage beans because they want six-foot-tall bean plants in, uh, in early September. Is that really tall bean plant really a really high number that it, it was growing with never an intention to, to – did I open up a can of worms we don't want to open here? No, but, not, not at all. But I, I think, think it's important for people to understand, is is a forage bean just a really, really high number that it never gets a chance to put on pods like our beans do? I think 10 or 12 years ago on this farm, Don and I did some videotaping and pictures, and we pulled on, uh, soybeans and leaf tissues and did analysis on it. And the, that big for the forage bean with that great big paper plate type leaf 
offers a lot of tonnage. Forage and tonnage go together, but what we're looking at is a high quality soybean content, and a lot of them, uh, as, as opposed to tonnage. The other thing is what you, if, if you notice in the summertime when the deer are feeding on it, they're not feeding. You don't see them walking around with a, a big old paper plate in their face. They're eating those beans that are about the size of a quarter because that's, that's the Young, sweet Young tender spot. leaves the, that's the that sweet are spot. the highest in nutrients. I, I want to throw something in here, Terry. This isn't this isn't the podcast, so be a little careful. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be more politically correct. So uh, on this farm years ago, five years in a row, when we started Real World, I planted a very popular forage bean right next to our Real World bean. And every year, you, you could watch the deer, and they would totally, when the beans dried down, they just totally avoided the forage bean. And, you know, when we started selling these, people were comparing them to forage bean, and it's not a forage bean. And one of the best things we did, one of the best marketing tools, is we tell anybody that's sold on forage beans, buy one bag, just one bag of real-world beans, and put them out there right next to your forage bean and see the difference. Yeah. And, you know, they'll say, well, the forage bean gets six feet tall. Well, that's because the deer's not eating them. That's why they get six (laughs) feet tall. If they were as palatable as they claim – the deer would keep them things eight down, and they wouldn't get six feet tall. Just plant one bag. Yeah, you I, see the big difference in late season once you they start focusing on the grain part of the, the soybean. Well, the other the other thing that people don't take into account for is, um, you know, the, what what pods they do produce never dried down. The frost ends up killing that plant. Right. So there's still moisture inside of that pod. Mm-hmm. That's either going to mold or it's going to turn to ice and blow apart, and and it doesn't give me anything. So we've always said from the very beginning that our soybeans kind of give you the best of both worlds. They get really tall plants with a lot of tonnage on it. Are they going to be as tall as forage beans? No, that's not what they're designed to. But it's really the balance of both worlds that we get that early season attraction and then we get the late season pods that I saw over 20 deer in on top of a soybean field tonight when it got cold. That's the magic of what, what our soybeans really give. Right. Yeah, it's, it's quantity and quality in the same product. And, and, you know, you can see the difference right in the bag of seed. Just look at the, the forage bean seed when you take it out of the bag. And Dwayne and I actually made a video on this years ago. You, you've got these little bitty immature beans that are about the size of a BB. They're discolored. Some of them are black brown just and, and you look at our soybean seed and it's uniform it's been treated um i don't know we, we didn't talk about going into this Dwayne might want to talk about what it's treated for it's a fungicide um you know to help with it, germination rates and things but you can just see the difference with if you had a, a hand of handful of each of the seed right out of the bag in your hand you can see the difference yeah um so Overall, our platform, we're kind of going a long way back to where we started with this pilot program of Enlist. The same goals and objectives that we've built this company on with Gen 2 Soybeans are really just extended into the Enlist program, and that's what our goals were. It's just with a different chemical trait so that we could kill these weeds, keep the weeds at bay to have the best plot we can. So let's let's dive in a little bit. Uh, Dwayne, we could talk for probably two hours on chemical programs and all the traits associated with it, but let's talk just a little bit about glyphosate tolerant is glyphosate's the, the major ingredient in Roundup, um, but, you know, the patent ran out on Roundup, so you can get generic, you know, glyphosate or glyphosate. Um, now, Enlist, what does Enlist 3 mean? Because there's multiple chemicals that you can use for Enlist trait plants. So that's right, Terry. So Roundup is still the foundation, but we've built off of that with a 2,4-D choline or 2,4-D colex is a product that you can use over the top for broadleaves as well. So it's our our attempt to clean up some pigweed that seems and mare's tail seems to be a problem as well. And then we can use Liberty Liberty or glufosinate as the the generic version Mm -hmm. of it. So it gives you a triple stack or a ver- a version of, of weed control. Right. So, and those chemicals are, you can buy those over the counter. You can buy them at your Rural King. He just mentioned it, the 2,4-D. You see that a lot in your ag aisle. Uh, 2,4-D is a broad leaf. It I doesn't, mean, but it doesn't kill grass. Right. Um, 
So using a combination of 2,4-D and, and glyphosate would kill your glass, um, your grass and your broadleaf. Right. Now, there's a combination, and we're not going to get into a lot of chemical uh, advice here. You need to talk to your chemical, but there's a combination of those that you don't want to use because they almost work against each other. What is that? Well, glyphosate and glufosinate, or were Liberty and Roundup, uh, they don't seem to work together very well. They, they almost seem to counteract each other and and do not kill the weeds very well at all. Yeah, so. so you need to use Liberty and 2,4-D or 2,4-D and... Glyphosate. Glyphosate. Yep. yep. So uh, keep that in, in mind. Um, but that, that enlist trait bean, basically it's allowing you to add another chemical because, you know, we've had people spray Gen 2 beans with what's called Roundup Max, and it had that other chemical in it, and they just killed their whole food plot. Right. So um, Gen 2 beans is Roundup or glyphosate only. Enlist allows you to add a different chemical combination to try to take care of the mare's tail, water hemp, and other other resistant weeds. Yeah, and in our in our attempt to bring this product to market, we chose the two four D platform because of its its ease to work with. Now there's there is a dicamba product on the market that um, is good. Farmers are using it, but it's just not friendly for the food plotter, and it's and it is the volatility of it is scary so so we've we've gone with a direction that is friendly for the food plotter well um i'm gonna basically say what that really means if somebody's trying to get an average food plotter to use dicamba you're getting yourself into a hornet's nest Uh, that product will actually fog up and raise up off the crop field after you spray it and can actually float over onto a neighbor's property and kill their crop Um, the farmers have actually done that that product is regulated if you end up with some of that stuff and end up spraying it um, you got issues because you you have to you have to basically sign your life away when you're using that product they control that just because of how volatile it is Um, the average food plotter to be quite frank has no business messing around with dicamba some of you expert farmers that also have you know, a food plot off to the side that understand chemical programs and everything, that's a different story. But average food plotters just don't have any business uh, messing with dicamba. Um, there's one other piece that I want to just touch on here real quick, and that's the use of pre-emergent with both corn and beans. Mm-hmm. And I think I think that it's um, it's people perceive it to be more complicated than what it is, but mm-hmm. a use of a good pre-emergent especially when we're talking about right now a shortage of chemicals might be a great tool for everyone to kind of explore this year and learn we're in a we're in a period you got three months you might as well start learning right so Mm -hmm. talk talk just for a minute about what a pre-emergent is well a pre-emergent is a chemical that prevents weeds basically in the simplest terms um you know a typical herbicide you got to spray it onto a a growing it's by contact and it gets in that weed system and it kills the weed well a residual or a pre-emergent, you know, it gets in the soil and it prevents those weeds. And I can tell you that I haven't planted soybeans or corn in, in several years without using a pre-emergent. It'll, it'll just, it'll really cut down on your weed competition. Then when you come back later, it's a whole lot easier to get things under control. Dwayne, when we use a pre-emergent, for um a, a spring product does that keep a fall product from growing and when we when we double seed something or is it kind of ran its shelf life before do we have to worry about anything with that there's a label and, and when you need to read the label on it because depending on the amount of product you put down the plant back date is listed on there and it can affect the fall product so I just teed that question up specifically because I know this guy and I know how he's going to answer the questions. This is why it's so important for you to work with your local chemical guy. Because if we get on here and say use a pre-emergent and your plan was to plant beans with top seed to plot topper or oats and you use a slightly variation of a brand or, or label of that chemical, you might have trouble getting that, mm-hmm. that other uh, crop to, to, to germinate in August. So talk about what your plan is with your local chem guy. They can help you. But um, I think I think especially we're going to talk about the shortage of chemicals that are going to be um, on the market this year. Don't be afraid to investigate pre-emergent because I think that's going to be a vital tool for everybody. Wes, before we move on, um, 
we, we need to explain something here, and that is we're going to leave Enlist Beans as a pilot program into 2022 for a very specific reason, and that is we still haven't seen what they do for Shatter in February yet. Talk mm-hmm. a little bit about just the strategy with that. Is there any changes to it from last year? <clears throat> Yeah, we've got good feedback. We've seen it on our own farms, but we just want a little more data, look at um, oil content and chatter resistance a little bit more, and get feedback from a broader range of uh, geographics. So still going to continue to have it in the pilot program. Yeah, so there's no changes um, to the blend. We're going to roll with what we had last year. We saw nothing alarming. Uh, Dwayne, as far as national averages, are we still above everything on the oil and – Right, so when you look at the national average across the Corn Belt and and the Midwest, our blends are above the national averages on protein and oil. Yeah, which which, which is, means attraction. That just translates to attraction. Yep, and energy in late season when when those temperatures drop. That's what's so vital. So, mm-hmm. if if you're sitting back wondering why did Nutra Crave end up with uh, you know coming out of the pilot program, because we have dried corn right now. We know what we have. Um, we were in the pilot program. We were very excited. Um, we, Don and I were just looking at a tr- uh, cell cam pictures of my farm um, here in Illinois with enlist beans on it. it. had 25 deer out in it. So we really like what we've seen so far, but we want to see what that shatter resistance is on in two more months right. um, after we have that. Because we haven't seen the ice, the storms of late season because of this growing season it's been warm so Mm -hmm. that's that's why we've decided to leave it into the pilot program we are increasing production of it a little bit because we know that the demand's there i'm going to be planning it so um that's the reason that the nutri crave went to a standard product and the enlist didn't um anything else on the enlist i don't think so okay so quality is going to be good yeah, another C-C another another good. great year on. We talked about that in the last episode with germination rates. So um, let's talk a little bit. We're adding a new product into 2022. So we have a new addition to the pilot program. This is something that, good grief, I think I think we've been testing versions of this for a few years now. Even our friends at Pro Talk Outdoors did some testing years ago on it. Uh, Wes, talk a little bit about the new product that we're releasing in this year's pilot program called Soil Charge. What is the idea behind it and what's the goals? Yeah, really excited about the this pilot program, Terry. Soil Charge, uh, like the name implies, it, its purpose is to boost the soil, um, put back some key nutrients into the soil. One of the most common questions we get at Real World is, hey, I love your Deadly Dozen, I love your fall product lineup, but what should I put there during the spring? And Soil Charge is a product that you can plant in the spring and it's going to help reduce your weed competition, have something there knowing that you're going to terminate that product in, sometime in August and plant Deadly Dozen or one of our fall products. So we're building soil we're giving something for the deer to eat in the spring, you know, at first green up. We, um, but we, uh, we want to offer something that works and in knowing we're going to terminate it. This right. is not a product that we're going to leave into the fall. Those, the plants that are in this mix are going to mature when right. we leave it there. So, so Dwayne, talk, just walk, walk us through the blend that, that we've put together for this pilot program and kind of what it's designed to do. So Don and I have been working a couple of years on putting the right blend together, and we've come up with with a, a blend of winter barley, uh, medium red clover. We've got rape in it and Austrian winter peas. So the winter barley will be the foundation for it. So it's a sod-based winter grass, or and we can plant it early in the spring. Uh, it'll tolerate cold. All these products are going to tolerate cold weather, so we can get it out early. The key on this product, Terry, is going to be to – we want to get in front of the weed pressure, not in with it or behind it. So can this be frost seeded? Do we need to wait for that 60 degree temperature? Tell us when when's yeah. the best time to plant it. So th- this product has the ability to put out 30 days before warm up. So okay. we can frost seed it on top of our deadly dozen, what's left of deadly dozen or our harvest salad. And it'll just act as an additional cover for this, this seed and it'll come up. Uh, on on through the existing crop it's there you know don had a good point um when we were talking the other day the guys that are repeatedly planting soybeans in the same spot 
broadcasting this into standard standing beans and then going with a fall plot to give that you know you might we just talked about how hard corn is to plant so if i have a bean field that's beans 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 for year after year putting this in on your bean stubble letting it grow then putting in a deadly dozen or a harvest salad fall mix for a year giving that ground a break building the soil back and then coming back with our rotation All um, right great opportunity to use that mm -hmm. um even though our goal is to get in front of those weeds, like what Dwayne just said, um, is broadcasting still the best method for this or the, the people that can't get it in quite that, or maybe they're down South, you know, there's a lot mm -hmm. of places down there that were never even frost seeding because they don't get the frost. Can you run this product through a drill? Oh, you can for sure. But, uh, I think Dwayne and I, the, the goal that we had was we want to get ahead of the weed competition. So we want to get that seed, you know, in, in, out there on the plot before the weeds come up. And that's why these species are in the mix, because we can go out there and we can frost seed them. If it gets a frost on it, it's not going to kill the seed. You know, if you would frost seed soybeans and you, and you get a frost on it, you've just killed that seed. Right. And these seeds are all going to survive and uh, get ahead of the weeds. Like anything else, the guys that want to... It's almost like trying to overcomplicate something. Sometimes simpler is better. In blends where you have a big variation of seed sizes, running those through a drill causes issues because I don't get the distribution or the diversity. I get hot spots because all my small seeds run through it. The best way to do this product is to broadcast it and get it in ahead of, of mm -hmm. when anything else is going to germinate. Uh, we see that in a healthy clover plot. You know, after deer eating clover for the whole winter, we have a bunch of void bare areas where they've trampled it down. If I can get that clover seed in there, that's the first to germinate, and I don't have a weed filling in that. I, if, All right. you can't, if you can't frost seed it, you just need to start clean. Start as clean as you can. And, and this product's going to be in a 45-pound bag, and that's designed to plant an acre. Okay. We don't want to stretch it. If the farther we pull those seeds apart, the more weed pressure we're going to have. So when you say start clean, you're talking about basically planting it like a spring food plot, you yeah. know, kill everything off, work the ground, yeah. and, and starting clean. If we can't frost seed right. it, basically you're planting it like soybeans, um, broadcasting soybeans then. Now, Wes, this product is available now on our website. Um, he, Dwayne just said 45 acres for one bag, um, you know, because if you watched episode one, you saw that there's a sheet, seed shortage of some things this year. We have a limited production of this this year. Right. Yep. It's pilot program, so it's going to be a limited quantity, 45 pounds for one acre. Yep. It's. Uh, but we would even make more for the pilot program if we could. But there is, due to the shortage of some of the some of the products, we weren't even able to make it. So the point is, if you want to be part of this program, want to try it, um, if it hits in a situation like I'm going to be planting it on a bean field that I've had in beans several years, you need to order it now. If you wait till spring, um you're going to probably be too late on this product yep. because yeah. of because of it being pilot and the seed shortages that we've talked about. So with with the maximum attraction that's going to have as well, expect some browsing pressure on it, which is it's good. It's what we want it to do, but that may have some effect on weed control and, and overall growth. As spring comes on and everything turns green, we're gonna we're gonna lighten up the pressures. There's, Food, yeah, everything readily available. Yeah, so Dwayne, there's some of our blends. You know, soybeans you can plant thick and not worry about it. Right. Um, upland game blend, we do not want to plant thick. Deadly dozen, we do not want plant thick. If we plant this a little heavy, does it hurt? Heavier is going to be better than thin okay. on, the, on this one, right? Just because it's going to fill the void areas, fill the gaps. Okay, S seeds per square foot's the key. All right, so if you're interested in learning more about the Soil Charge Pilot Program for 2022, visit our website. It is available there now. Um, I guess um, well, the the biggest thing that, that has a lot of food plotters and farmers concerned right now is the supply chain as it comes to fertilizer and chemicals. Mm -hmm. So, um, Wes, everywhere we turn, there's a shortage of either product or people. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be chicken wings today or a waitress tomorrow. What do we know about this chemical shortage that we've seen so far, you know, trickling out from, you know, people we talk to like Dwayne who deals in the ag industry? Uncertainty. <laughs> um, 
it seems like 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 you said you don't know if it's going to be chicken wings or what's going to be the next shortage but when it comes to herbicides and fertilizers it seems like um there you just don't know what's going to be available uh Dwayne you know it's not uncommon for farmers to go ahead and order chemicals and fertilizer before the end of the year because that's another input cost that they're writing off on the previous tax year but I think this uncertainty has created a little, almost a little bit of a panic and everybody's running. I went into Rural King here in, in Illinois yesterday and they actually even have a limit on how many jugs you can buy. Huh. Right. It's a pandemic type attitude that it's, that's being created here on this. And and I, I no doubt I think there is some shortages, but if, if it's time to start sourcing some of these things and, and get, them, get them in your possession. So Don, you know, we saw this as... We have a lot of connections, basically. We have a lot of, and one of our fears is that we can, we can sell the best food plot seed on the market, but if somebody doesn't have the other inputs to make it successful, our success is dependent on that. And Mm -hmm. unfortunately, when a food plot fails, you guys always think it's the seed's fault. You know, it could be, it could be underwater for, for a month and it's still the seed's fault, but you saw an opportunity that isn't really what we normally do but we we pulled some strings to try to give our customers some help with this so why don't you talk a little bit about what we're going to try to do for people this year well we've added some chemicals to our product line basically for a multiple reasons really terry uh, we get a lot of questions on herbicides for our products and it, you, you kind of alluded to it earlier you know the people spraying the, the wrong roundup product on their soybeans have actually killed them Right. And we, we just seen an opportunity, you know, to, to supply the right chemical for our products. And we've seen the shortage coming, too. So Wes and I have tried our best to secure some chemicals um, that are used with our products this year. And we've had very limited success because of the tight supply chains. And we are going to have we've, – we've already got two chemicals in stock, um, and we're trying to secure some others that are used with our products. But um, to, be, to be honest, right now when we're recording this, we don't know what chemicals we're going to end up with. We had a list of about, what, eight or ten that we wanted, and we've got two so far. Now, we're going to have more than two, but we don't know which ones, and – We're just trying to help our customers be successful. Right. So it's an opportunity where we have the ability with, you know, there's, there is some permit type things you have to have to deal with chemicals. This isn't going to be out to our dealers. Our dealers won't be participating in this. This is something that we just saw a way that um, we can try to help the customer, especially in this shortage to get their hands on some of this stuff. Unfortunately, the snowball effect of the pandemic and the shortage got even ahead of us where what we were trying to do. Um, So in the coming weeks, you're going to see some uh, new products on the website, um, a new page with chemicals, and we'll be releasing that. The other thing that might be the low-hanging fruit on this is depending on what product you buy and what chemical you buy that we come, you might be able to put those in the same box and ship them together to Mm -hmm. save shipping costs. So, um, you know, honestly, we don't know where this is going to go. Um, it's just an opportunity for us to grab hold of some of this stuff and give you guys another place to potentially buy it if you can't. Um, I don't know what else to really say about it. Um, stay, so, stay tuned as exactly. we navigate it. Right. Those are some of the most common questions we get is, I got grass in my clover. What do I spray with? Spray it with clothidem or uh, native grass control, quinclorac. Um, some of those common herbicides that we get those questions all the time at the office so you know instead of making a brochure we make what's called a land management guide and uh, there's a page in there where we give detail about what herbicides go with what products so if you have not gotten a land management guide just so everybody knows they ship for free with every online order we give a stack of them to every dealer we were going to put one in every copy of North American Whitetail, but we couldn't find enough paper to print that <laughs> many, so that got scrapped. And we have them on our website. You can go ahead and order one. They're free of charge with a $3 shipping. Um, we, you just pay for shipping. We'll, we'll send you one. But um, there is a, a, a couple um, very good graphics in there for those especially beginning food plotters to kind of 
ease the uncertainty of I spent all this money on seed. Am I going to kill it with a chemical? So, um, and we'll try to continue to keep everybody informed. If we can get chemicals and get them in stock to, so that it gives you a way to source them, we're going to do that for you as a service. Um, but you know, we're limited just like you are, but I'm hoping that with the bulk that we're buying, we can get our hands on some more of it. Dwayne, what about fertilizer? We're not going to sell fertilizer, but I know Kitchen Seed sells some fertilizer. What is is it the same thing? Do people need to go ahead and start acquiring their? So bag fertilizer should be f- fairly available, I would say. But in the ag industry, the phosphorus and, and potash is tight supply, as well as nitrogen is just buku expensive right now. So, it, it, yeah, you need to you need, get it sort get it sourced sooner the better. The, the difficulty in it is a lot of people don't do their soil test till the spring and they don't know what fertilizer they need. And, you know, when you're putting these inputs into your soil, you might be putting inputs that you don't need and it's wasting money and, and when the price is going up. So it, it's a delicate balance, um, you know, just do the best you can. Again, talk to your local farm stores. Um, we don't know what we're going to be navigating with this whole supply chain nightmare. So um, with that, I don't have anything else. Do you guys? I don't think so. All right. Well, uh, thanks for watching episode two. We hope that this just very easygoing format helps educate you. And, you know, like I said in the first episode, there's some companies out there that are just putting a celebrity on a bag saying this is the best. There's people like us that are just trying to be honest and giving you the tools to make the best decision possible. I will go ahead and plug our next episode is going to be focusing on deer nutrition with our Maximizer product line and how we're continuing to evolve the expect healthy deer technology um, additive that's in some of our products. So stay tuned for the next one on that. And we'll be talking about deer nutrition and our product changes for 2022. We want to thank you all. Please go out and like our social media page, real world wildlife products, go to our website and click the dealer locator. Um, We talked about that last week, working with your local dealers is going to be the cheapest way you can get the products into your hands. So again, on behalf of Dwayne Hopkins, our head seedsman, uh, Wes Delks, our general manager and our president, Don Higgins, I'm Terry Peer. Tune in next time. Thank you. (laughs)